Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm pleased to introduce our guests this evening. Alex Michaelides is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Silent Patient, a debut thriller that, according to Entertainment Weekly, lends Hitchcockian suspense, Agatha Christie plotting, and Greek tragedy. The book tells the tale of a criminal psychotherapist's quest to unravel a taciturn artist's motivation for murder. A native of Cyprus, Michael Leedy studied English literature at Trinity College and screenwriting with the American Film Institute. In his new novel, a group therapist delves behind Cambridge University's tranquil spires to investigate the murder of a young woman involved in a secret society known as the Maidens. I gave an early copy to a friend of mine who's a terrific reader and she called it Creeptastic. Tonight, Alex will be in conversation with global number one best-selling author, David Baldacci, whose books are published in over 45 languages in more than 80 countries with 150 million copies sold worldwide. His latest Aloysius Archer novel, A Gambling Man, is on sale now. Gentlemen, we're excited to have you with us. The screen is yours. Welcome to everybody. Alex, we've exchanged emails, but it's just terrific to actually see you sort of in person. You know? Yeah, totally. It's, it's such a, it's just a thrill and an honor to talk to you. So thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. I feel the same. And uh, it's just nice, even, even across the pond on Zoom, it's nice to be able to talk to you. I, um, before The Silent Patient came out, Jamie Rabb, who I know is your publisher, um, sent me a copy. She was my long-term publisher when it used to be Warner Books. Um, and she sent me the advanced reader for a silent patient and asked me to take a look. And I respect the, the hell out of Jamie. So I did. And I was glad that I did. It was a terrific read. And um, certainly I'm a fan of yours now. Um, so before we get started on the maidens, um, let's, I think people would like to back up a little bit and talk about the silent patient. You know, um, can you tell us sort of where that came from, what you were doing in your life at the time, where the idea came from, and how did you actually end up writing that book? Right. Um, well, you know, these uh, the way these things happen, as, as, as you know better than, than anybody else, is I, I don't think ideas just come in one shape or form. They, they come as kind of strands of ideas that build up over years. Um, and so, I, you know, I think they're kind of three elements, really. One was the, um, the mythology, um, one was the psychology, and one was the, the, uh, the murder. And the murder is probably the most fun. Um, and that came from, you know, so I grew up in Cyprus, um, the island of Cyprus, sort of reading thrillers on the beach. And um, I kind of fell in love with like classic thrillers. Um, and they were probably the first adult books that I ever read. Um, and so I discovered them one day by sneaking into my sister's bedroom and just seeing these rather lurid kind of covers of these Agatha Christie's. Um, and I just fell in love with them. They looked so, you know, creeptastic. Um, and so I took them to the beach and read one. And then I just spent the summer when I was like 13 or so, just devouring them one after the other, after the other. And I made the decision then and there that if I was ever to write a book, it would have to be that kind of book. It would have to be a kind of detective story with a twist, you know? Um, and then the rest came from, you know, mythology had always been an interest because I grew up in Cyprus again, and it's kind of steeped in, in Greek mythology. And the island features really heavily in the Greek myths. And I, you grow up kind of being taught Euripides and Homer at school. So it was a big influence on me. Um, and so I've been, you know, very intrigued by this myth of Alcestis and the play by Euripides for, for 20 years or so. Um, and then uh, I'd always tried to adapt it in a way. And I thought once I did it as a short film and then I did it as a one act play and I couldn't quite make it work. And then um, years later, I was working in a psychiatric unit and it suddenly occurred to me, oh, what if I update the whole thing and set it here inside a psychiatric unit and I make it into a kind of detective story. And then it all came together in my head. But you know, it's funny, it took like 20 odd years of these different things kind of percolating before it all, crystallized. I, I, can you relate to that? Hmm. Yeah, I clearly can. I mean, um, it's a writing a novel is a long, hard road. And the last thing you want to do is jump into it too quickly. You haven't thought it through enough and you run out of gas. The creative gas ends after a few months and you got a hundred pages that are no good and you throw them away. It was a waste of time. And it's also depressing, you know, and it's easy for writers to get depressed. You know, you're by yourself all the time writing alone. There's nobody out there clamoring for your stuff. You're just trying to create something that you haven't created before. And failures like that, while they can be learning experiences, I found that if I take more time now to sort of think about what I want to write about, 
and make sure that I'm incredibly interested in it. My old, my adage is don't really write about things you know a lot about, but write about things you'd like to know a lot about. And if you have the passion in figuring out and investigating the subject matter, all of a sudden that passion comes through in the prose and the plot and the characters, it lifts it all up. It gets it out of the sludge piles that are covered all over New York publishing houses right now. Uh, and people writing things that they really didn't you know, care about, but they're chasing the next trend. I remember when Jurassic Park came out, I swear to God, every script pitched and every book written uh, had to do with, had, you know, like dinosaurs running. It could be a romantic comedy. You have like a T-Rex running right down the hallway you know, because everybody was chasing success for, for uh, Jurassic Park. So I totally agree with you there. It's such great advice, you know, because right now I'm trying, I'm trying to work out which of the, the four ideas I'm working on should be my next book. And I've been beating myself up a bit about it today, trying to come, I can't decide. It's, it's really helpful. So you should think, pick the one that you're most interested in discovering, learning that world, right? Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's really true. And if you think about yourself, if take each one of those ideas and, and think about it in six months time, will I still be jazzed about this one or this one or this one or this one? And you sort of these you know, the webs that come out from it, how much can each one generate as far as interest and stuff that I can think about and do and research. And I would pick the one that really that web is more full than any of the others. Um, oh, God, that's such great advice. Thank you. I feel like I should log off now and go and get back to work. <laughs> well, as far as the detectives go, I, I, read, I read a line one time about John Updike, who, you know, fabulous writer, Pulitzer Prize winner. I read so many of his books. Somebody asked him one time, um, have you ever thought about writing a mystery? And he said, no. And they asked him why. And he said, I'm not smart enough. And I don't know if that's apocryphal or not. I like to, to think that it's true. <laughs> but mysteries, you know, they have everything that any other novel has. They have characters and plot and narrative. And, but they also have that overlay of clues and red herrings and just an, sort of another plot laid over top of it that other novels don't have to have by and large. Uh, so I think that obviously in the, in the Silent Patient and in The Maidens, you proved yourself, you know, incredible about laying the plots out um, because those, those are difficult to do and misdirection and pointing people down certain pathways. Um, you don't get that, I think, unless, unless you, I think of it very much as a craft or architecture or even like a magic trick, the whole thing you're doing. And you don't get that doesn't come overnight. You know, for me, it came from being a reader and obsessively loving these, these thrillers and studying them and breaking them down and reading them again and again and again until you start to you know, and every time I get lost now, I still do that. I go back to Christy and think, because she's the master of like, you know, set up and pay off and red herring and twist and, you know. Yeah, it's almost like studying game film and sports. You know, I tell people say, do you, do you still read? I said, well, I read for two reasons. One, I love to read. I love to escape into other people's imagination. And two, I like to see other writers do what they do. You know, everybody has a slightly different take and you can see that sort of, the, sometimes it really stimulates you to sort of raise your game a little bit. And push yourself a little bit harder, come up with more interesting phrases and descriptions uh, and more intriguing plots. So, but and talk about an intriguing plots. So let's, let's talk about the maiden a little bit, which is, I know I went through it myself a long time ago. You know, sophomore efforts are very difficult. I think you and I emailed about this a little bit. Yeah. It comes from a very big success with your first novel, Expectations Are Sky High. Um, sometimes that pressure can be crushing. Um, I think, you know, both of us managed to sort of Put, put it out of the way with a little difficulty and focus on, look, you just have to worry about writing the story. Write it as if it's your first novel over and over. Nobody's waiting for it. There's no pressure. Just sit down and tell the best story you can. So with that intro, let's talk about the maiden a little bit, you know, where the, the idea came from and sort of where you were at that point in your life about, you know, why this story, why now, and how did you put it all together? Gosh, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I know, first of all, about the second album. I mean, I relate it to a lot of my favorite singers who've all had disastrous second albums. And I was very you know, conscious of that. And it's, it's tricky because you, you really want it to be as good as possible. Um, and so I, for what I did straight away was I just thought, okay, well, I have to just shut these voices out and I have to try and write something just for that kid on the beach again and write something for myself to read on the beach. Um, and that was the only way that I could kind of reduce it in size to make it sort of manageable. Um, and then I don't, I don't know the idea. The idea came from... I went back to the kind of the themes that fascinate me really, which is again, you know, Greek mythology and psychology and murder. Um, and I tried to think about another really great place to set a novel, um, which again comes from, you know, classic thrillers like Christie's where every novel, every thriller is set in an iconic enclosed location. And the reason that I came up with a psychiatric unit for the silent patient was that Christie had never done that. And then I thought, well, what else has she never done? 
And then it occurred to me she'd never set a college, a mystery at a, at a college, at a Cambridge College or Oxford College, because she didn't go to university, I think. So I think she didn't have that experience. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I know a little bit about that world because I was a student there. So I can make it quite real, I think, and I can give people a slight insight into that secretive, mysterious world, which is a great backdrop for that kind of mystery, suspense story. Um, and then it, it went from there, really. Um, but it started with the location this time. Um, you also, in the silent patient in Liz's book, sort of your detective, if you will, uh, has a background in psychiatry, psychology, uh, and mental health. And you yeah. mentioned worked in a facility like that. Can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I came to therapy as a patient because I was quite messed up. I was quite anxious. I mean, still quite anxious, but I was, um, I was more anxious. And I was depressed, I think, as a teenager. And then I kind of had been recommended to a, a therapist, to a friend who was a, an analyst. And I sort of beat her door down at the age of 20. And, um, and she changed my life, really, because I saw her then, like, you know, once or twice a week for 10 years. Um, and I became so interested in it. I thought, oh, well, I'd like to study this. Um, so I did. I began studying it. Um, and then I started working in this psychiatric um, unit for teenagers, which was the most amazing, um, uh, formative, humbling, incredible experience of my life, really. And I think if it hadn't been shut down by the cuts after the financial crash, I would still, still be there, probably. Um, uh, because it was, it was, it's hard to put into words, really, but when you, when you work with the sort of, when you, when you were terrified of teenagers and you feel you had a really bad time and you're quite, you know, anxious, when you work with these kids and you realize they're just kids and you realize that they're, they're such wonderful kids and they've come from such a bad, terrible, disadvantaged start in life, it kind of healed all of that, you know, messed up teenage stuff that I was still carrying around in me. Um, and it made me sort of really kind of, fascinated with the human psyche even more so. Um, uh, the problem was that I encountered, you know, a, a massive number of therapists who I thought were brilliant, but an equal number who I thought were as crazy as the people they were trying to treat. And it became a problem for me and I felt increasingly ambivalent about it. Um, and, I, and I thought, well, I've never really seen on screen, I've never really seen a thera uh, therapy session that I, you know, recognize as real, e even in The Sopranos, which I deeply love. It's not, I didn't, it wasn't like any session I'd ever been in. And I thought, well, why don't I write a book about a really complicated therapist? Because I know nothing about detectives. And so I feared that if I tried to write my first novel about a detective, it would be a complete disaster. So I thought, well, I can be, have a psychological detective and I can have a therapist, you know? And then equally with the maidens, I, I specialized in group therapy. And um, I, I felt that there was a lot, I, a lot of stuff I still had to say about therapy. And group therapy, I find really fascinating. And obviously a college is a group. Um, and this, the Maidens, the secret society of the girls within, within the, the novel is also a group. So it's a group within a group. Um, you know, and I, I, had a, I had a kind of bad experience with a, a group analyst, which is why I quit my training. Um, he just was a bit of a bully. Um, and all these vulnerable people within the group would take the bullying. And I just thought, no. I'm not going to I'm not going to give my authority to you just because you are a professor with lots of letters off to your name. I kind of have to stand up for what I believe in and grow up and leave. And I quit my training, you know, David, which was really traumatic. And so it took that was 10 years before I was able to write about these experiences in the silent patient and the maidens. So it's, again, one of those examples that we were just saying about something, something that happens to you and you can't quite process it. But if you're a writer, sooner or later, it works its way into your writing, I think, you know. So a long answer to a short question. So sorry about that. We want, we want those complicated and layered answers. And I think that, you know, for me over the years, um, we all have issues and problems and challenges in life, but writing for me, some of the best therapy I think I've ever had. Um, it allows an introspection that a lot of other tasks in life don't really allow for. And it allows you to go at least in a safe way down paths uh, and explore them. Uh, and then hopefully make your way back. Um, when I was in college, I I got a I went to uh, this job app, app opening. It was um, a Pinkerton security guard. I needed the money. I paid my way through college, so I went in at four o'clock in the afternoon for an interview. 
Uh, and as, after extensive training by Pinkerton, at seven o'clock that night, I was in uniform. Uh, the only thing they asked me was the size of the uniform, my, my size, and whether I wanted a gun or not. So I told them I was in my uniform and I did not want a gun. They were like, you're the only one who didn't want a gun. Why don't you want a gun? I said, well, for $4 an hour, if I have a gun and they have a gun, they're more, much more likely to shoot me. So I don't want a gun. So one of my first jobs was I worked at a hospital and they had a psychiatric ward wing to it, a secure wing. And part of the rounds I would make, I would have to go in there and the other guards hated to go in there because they just like being around people like that. And there were sometimes there were fights and altercations and it wasn't, you know, pleasant for them. And, and at first I felt the same way. Um, I mean, I was, I was 20 years old and I didn't know anything about any of this. I just wanted to make some money to pay for college. Um, but, and I went in with a uniform, so I looked like this authority figure that didn't help matters. And there was a lot of friction at first. But then I just took my hat off and took my equipment off and I would just go in and just sit with some of them and just listen um, and they could talk. It wasn't therapy. I, I was not a professional, I'm not experienced, but sometimes I think they just wanted somebody to talk to. Um, and I didn't, you know, I learned a lot, uh, not only about them, but I learned a lot about myself. I think there were uh, some positive things that came out of that for all of us. So therapy in whatever form, um, I think can be a very positive thing. Now, I you're was right about, sorry to interrupt you, but you're right about it being a, a therapeutic experience because um, when I finished the maidens, I, somebody asked me if it was an exorcism and it wasn't, but it was definitely a catharsis because I feel like by, somehow I've kind of transferred that relationship that I had with that professor into the maidens because he ended up being the inspiration for Edward Fosker, who is this quite menacing predatory professor in, in the college and being able to work through all of that stuff, albeit in a kind of metaphorical way somehow you, you're left feeling like you, you've dealt with it now. It's a really strange feeling. I feel like I can put it behind me and I can write about something different next time. Well, it allowed you to create a very authentic character. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you channel from real life definitely worked on the, on the fictional page um, because you came across exactly like that. Um, and you got a definite feel and vibe for him from the very first page and it carried throughout the entire rest of the book. So that was very well done. Um, I've written for film. I've adapted one of my own books into film. Um, some of the hardest work I've ever done. And so I was intrigued. You know, you have a background uh, in, in screenwriting. Um, I'd like you to sort of, I've asked writers to do both. I, I'd like you to contrast, you know, what do you like about each? What do you not like about each? Do you have a favorite? Does it depend on the time point in your life or, or what? In terms of screenplay writing versus novels, you mean? Oh, well, I know you adapted your own work, and I was curious to hear your experience of that. I think it must be different when you adapt your own material, which I've not done. Um, but because presumably you have you have more control and you're more important. I mean, I think the problem that I what I didn't like about screenwriting that I found really heartbreaking was that the screenwriter, nonsensically to my mind, is the least important person on a film set. Um, and so I just kept you know would work on five for five years on on a screenplay, like honing it, and then just see it you know, torn apart by a director on set or rewritten by the director or the actor, even worse, the actors, um, right in front of you without being really being allowed to participate or because you weren't important enough. And, and you know, and it was, it was kind of heartbreaking because I kept seeing these things falling apart in front of my eyes and then would receive like a, a panicked phone call from the edit, from the director in the editing room, like six months later saying, oh my God, it doesn't cut together, it doesn't work. And I was like, well, I, I knew that. I knew that when it was happening, but, but you wouldn't listen to me. Um, and so it kind of killed my will to write. I thought, I'm going to give up. I have to just stop doing this to myself because it wasn't, it was felt like it was each film was worse than the last. Um, and um, the last one was so bad that it had two titles. It was one of those movies. It was a real turkey. Um, and I, um, so I thought I had this whispering voice about writing this detective story since I was a kid. And I thought, well, that's the only way that I can be in control of this artistic process and I can actually be in charge of it and make sure that it, does it, it, it is complete in the way that I think it should be um, with just me and a laptop. Um, and it, it, uh, it worked out really well because I think I'm a better uh, novelist and screenwriter for sure. Um, I, I completely agree with you on that. It's uh, screenwriting, is, it's a collaborative affair. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. It used to be in Hollywood in the early days, 20s, 30s, and up until like the mid 40s where the writer was sort of the chief of, of everybody else. Then the Directors Guild and some very powerful directors out there came together and really flipped that on its head um, and changed that whole world around. And TV is a little bit different. The showrunners are typically, you know, writers, yeah. so that's a little bit different. Um, 
now we're writing, you are sort of the master and commander, you know, and you can, you write what you want and you have people who just suggest editorial comments and changes. You can take them or not. At the end of the day, the product is yours. I, I for like 20 years, I've had this adage about, about film and television. Um, people ask, well, you have, you know, do you have input? Do you have control? Do you have you know, casting, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, I have one rule. I never want to have so much control over a film project such that if it fails, they can blame me. <laughs> and they will. So I want to have limited input. My best defense is I, I always interview filmmakers. I have right now, who knows if they're ever going to come to fruition, but three different um, series, book series in development for television right now. And my best defense is that, you know, I've interviewed all the filmmakers who came to me and I had multiple ones and ones that didn't share the vision I had for the story and the characters and sort of the arc of what's going to transpire over the television series. Um, I didn't want to work with them. The ones that came closest, it's never going to be a perfect alignment. The ones who came closest, I gave them green light to, and we're working through those things. And hopefully they'll be good series if they ever come to fruition. But that's really the best you can do. Um, the last thing you want to do is, you know, it comes out and it sucks and you're, ha and you're hating life and you spend the next 10 years letting it eat your soul out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, to be honest with you, I think I was really kind of burned by my experience in Hollywood. So I'm not, I'm not writing either adaptation for the, the Silent Patients can be a movie and The Maidens is going to be a TV series. Um, and I'm not even going to read the, screen, the scripts for them because I know from bitter experience that the script never resembles the finished product anyway. So I'd rather just trust the people that I'm working with and I do. And, you know, and I also believe, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, that, that everybody tells, retells the story themselves. So, you know, when when the screenplay is written, then it's a screenwriter's story, but then the director retells it on set, and then the editor retells it in the editing room. You know, and, and likewise, so when I was talking to the, the writer of The Maidens, she had some questions for me, and I said, you know what, I think it has to be your baby from now on, and you have to answer these questions yourself, um, and I'm just going to watch it on, on TV and, and really enjoy watching it, you know, as something different. And I think it's about control, and I think I think when I was younger, I was a bad writer because I was so controlling and I would get hung up on, on bad ideas and bad dialogue and black, bad plot twists that I thought were amazing. And I'd be rigid and I wouldn't change. And what, you know, 20 years of, of relative failure does for you is it makes you a bit more humble and a bit more plastic. And so now I'm able to like not try and control everything and it can be much more like, okay, it's not, it's no good, I'll start again, or, or you go ahead and you do your thing. And I think that's, I really think creativity is about that, being plastic to some degree. It is. I think the best writers are the ones who are the most brutal on themselves as far as being flexible and adaptable and knowing when to uh, cut your losses and move on to something else and not trying to ram a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. Which I think we did that early in our careers just because we were obstinate and stubborn and wanted to make it work. And we felt like if this angle didn't work, we were somehow a failure. And actually, failures are all part of the creative process. And part of what you do, like, so to answer your earlier question, what, what do I love about Hollywood? It makes me think of this quote by Tom Stopper that I think about all the time. And he said, what you're a big fan of, you're not necessarily that good at. Um, and that was the thing is that I love movies. Like, I really, really love movies. And I have drawn a massive amount of inspiration from films, as much as I have from novels. So when I was writing The Maidens, I just watching um, uh, Vertigo again and again and again and again. And I'm obsessed with Hitchcock and Pedro Almodovar and Billy Wilder and stuff like that. And so... I was, it was my love of all of that that drew me to Hollywood, that I would have better off just being a fan, you know, and actually just writing a novel instead. I think. I think you're doing exactly what you should be doing. People are going to be clamoring for your third novel, your fourth and your fifth. So that's where you should devote your time to. And I, I'm reminded of a story that I'm a huge Raymond Chandler fan, Ross McDonald fan. And um, I'm now writing a crime series set in the 40s and 50s because crime noir is, is a genre that I absolutely love. And uh, Raymond Chandler, probably his best known work and probably best known film adaptation was The Big Sleep, Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart, Philip Marlowe, his debut on, on the silver screen. William Faulkner, Nobel Prize winner, wrote the screenplay for The Big Sleep. Um, and there was, Chandler was famous for, he had written a lot of short stories and novellas before writing novels. And he would cut and paste from those to build into his novels. And sometimes, oftentimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. The problem with The Big Sleep was, when they were reading the book and adapting it to the film, which is pretty, pretty, you know, good adaptation and pretty clean, um, nobody could figure out, who <laughs> Opal, you know, and why he wanted the car off of Lido Pier and who killed him. So they sent a telegram uh, to Raymond Chandler and they said, "Who killed the chauffeur?" and 
and famously channeled Telegram back and said, I don't know. So they had to come up with a, a reason why somebody killed the chauffeur. And, and that's why, you know, books and, and scripts and films are just very different beasts and animals. What works brilliantly, because I remember reading, you know, The Big Sleep 10 times, never really thought about or wondered or cared about who killed the chauffeur. Uh, it was all the rest of the book that I was interested in. But if you're doing the film adaptation, and that is a big part of the plot, uh, you have to have an answer to that. So it's, it's a crazy world when uh, you're trying to create stuff from scratch and particularly from something that's already been written. Yeah, 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 totally. I've seen that film many times and never fully understood it. I don't think I'm alone there either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the same thing, my, I, another one of the films I love is Chinatown. Uh -huh. I tried to get my, my wife to watch it many times and she's, she says it's totally confusing. I said, look, it's easy. All Chinatown is, it's about water. And, but, but forget that. It just look at the clothes, look at the cigarettes, look at the cars, listen to the dialogue, you know, in the, in the character relationships. That's what this is all about. But at the bottom line, if you want to know the plot is about water, so many people trying to steal it because it's really valuable in California. There's not a lot of it, but um, those are the types of stories that are very much character driven. The plots are terrific. I, I have to say that books that I've loved in my life, I would be hard pressed to really give you the exact details of the plot, but I remember the characters vividly. Um, because characters are the only connection on a human level that writers can connect with readers. They don't really connect viscerally with plots. They connect with human beings that are on the pages. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's so brilliant you say that because I think that I think I always had a facility for plot. And I think that all the screenplays I wrote were really shallow. And I was unable to access depth until I suddenly went into, went to wrote prose and wrote a novel and realized that you can go inside a character's mind. And you can you know slow down time and you go know, backwards and forwards in time or go for a walk with a character and all of that stuff completely blew my head off and changed me as a writer i think it, I, obviously some people can access that in screenplays but for whatever reason just doing it in dialogue i found really hard um yeah it is i i over the last probably 10 or 12 years i've been doing more series where i just have the same characters coming back from different books and i equate the standalone books that i did with like a feature film you one shot and that's it you're never going to see them again and the series are sort of like a television series where I have a second, third, fourth, fifth shot, a crack at these characters to evolve them, to develop them further. Uh, and I quite like that because sometimes one or two books is just not enough to get everything out of those characters you want to get out of them. Um, so, and, and it also, you know, I've been doing this a long time too, and it's a way for me to, creating new series is a way for me to fight against complacency. William Goldman wrote the script for Absolute Power, and I spent a lot of time with him and learned a lot from him. And, he, one of the best pieces of advice he gave to me was the first time you think you know what you're doing as a, as a writer, you might as well hang it up because you've lost the only edge you have that actually allows you to create cool stuff. Wow. Uh, because then you just become a maker of widgets. You know, it's just a formula. You're a factory. This is how I did it last time. Let me just change the names. The plot's going to be essentially the same. So he said, every time you sit down, be scared to death. You can't burn the magic again. And that will give you the impetus and the creative energy to actually do it again and again and again. And so we're doing these series with different characters, different places. I have to reinvent things all the time. It really forces me out of complacency. I've always said that fear is a great antidote to complacency. <laughs> <laughs> Let me sit down in front of the screen. Yeah, I relate to that <laughs> on every level. <laughs> well, take me through, I, um, we're going to be taking some questions to the audience shortly, but take me through a typical writing day for you. Um, well, the pandemic has complicated it, to be honest with you, but I, I hasn't changed it that much. And I'm sure you will agree, because I think all writers are kind of similar. Um, I really believe that solitude is important to be a writer. And so I tend to get in quite weird hermit like states um, where I will just be on my own for a lot of the time and will kind of live with the story, live with the, the book I'm writing and try and become the characters and go to bed thinking about them and think about them overnight and then wake up thinking about, you know, and so I don't like to get too many other voices in my head. Um, and I, um, I tend to walk a lot on Hampstead Heath, which is near where I live, it's a huge wild park. And I get a lot of, I, a lot of, I write and then I'll go for a walk and, you know, so I meditate a lot. Um, I go to the gym and I come back and I meditate um, because um, I still have a lot of like, you know, cr self-defeating, critical, negative thoughts like this is rubbish, this is rubbish, throw it away, you, you'll, there's no point in continuing. And with the silent patient, it was, I would get to the point sometimes where I would just put the manuscript away for weeks or months because I just thought it was rubbish and there was no point in continuing. Um, and now I look back on that and I realize that that wasn't true. Those were just thoughts in my head. 
Um, and what meditating does for me is allows me to kind of see the thoughts and park them and then keep working. Because um, I, I suspect, I'm sure you'll agree with me, that those thoughts will probably never go away. And it's a little like you're talking about the fear, you know, that's with you the whole time. Um, but the pandemic was great because I, I was, uh, I got to travel the world with this silent patient, going to all these different countries, which was the most amazing experience of my life, and meeting all these generally, you know, great readers, but also amazing publishers. And I've made all these new friends and it's been fantastic. But I was aware that I was running away from my writing. Um, and I got back from Norway and then the pandemic struck and all of my other trips were canceled. And suddenly I was locked in my apartment in London for a year, pretty much. And, it, and, I, and I kind of did the book. Um, and I'm really glad that it went that way. And I didn't kind of reach for a bottle of vodka every day instead, but I managed to just focus and write. And I think that I need that kind of discipline um, in order to create. I need to be sitting at my kitchen table. Um, you know, it, I was so angry that I ended up back at my kitchen table where I wrote The Silent Patient. Uh, but in the end, now I think, oh, that was probably the, the place that I needed to be, you know? Yeah, I know when, you know, your, the first book is very successful and everybody wants you to be everywhere, you know, at the same time. They want you to keep traveling and traveling. And, and finally, you have to tell people, you know what, if I keep traveling, I won't write and you won't want to see me again. You know? <laughs> the only reason I'm, you want to see me is because I'm writing books. And so I have, really have to take a step back. The, the pandemic has been, you know, the only silver lining for me is all my travel was canceled and I sat down and I was very productive and, you know, wrote a lot. Um, and, and I'm as far ahead of schedule now as I've ever been in my entire career as far as, you know, books. I'm into 2023 right now, which is, you know, fantastic for me and everybody. That's happy. amazing. That makes me really happy to hear that because I hear from a lot of people that they, they weren't productive during lockdown. And, I, and for me, it was it really helped me concentrate my mind, I think. Well, you mentioned the word immersive, which I, I used it a lot. You know, I outline some, I, I think that you outline a lot as well. Um, but for me, the, the outlines are important, but not, not critical. The critical part is Im immersion into the subject matter. It's almost a difference between, if you want to learn how to drive a Formula One car, you can read a book about it, or you can drive one. And driving one and reading about it are two different things. Um, and much like outlining a novel and actually writing a novel are two very different things. And when you're immersed in the story itself, your mind is firing off, you know, a million synapses a second. And you're seeing the entire field, all the possibilities that maybe you didn't see everything while you were outlining it because the energy, the import, the urgency is not the same. Um, you just can't get, I totally agree, you can't get an outline. I outline obsessively. And I think, again, that comes through, through fear. Um, but when you actually sit down to write the novel, you realize that it was, it is, it is like the, the difference between reading and driving because suddenly you're, an outline you can never really be the character until you actually start writing the sentences and then it kind of comes alive um it's quite a magical process i think it, it is and it's you know it, it's difficult at times i mean some of the best productive days i've had are where it's really really difficult and i don't think i've accomplished a lot but when i go back the next day and sort of read over the pages that i've written i, I realized that it was a very productive day things were positive at the end it's a very subjective business you know, and some days you think you're doing really well. Some days you think it just sucked and, you know, just burn it all down. Um, but you understand, I've come to understand, and I know you have too, that this is, if it weren't that, it wouldn't be normal. It wouldn't be the way it should be because this is, it's not like going to, in most other professions, you get really good at something by doing the same thing over and over again. You know, I wouldn't want to get on a plane where the pilot says, I've flown this plane the same way every day. Today I'm uh, differently. You know, or a surgeon, I'm, I'm right-handed, every surgery right-handed, let's see what I could do with my left hand. But that's what you have to do as a writer. You don't want to say, you know, how, do, how did I exactly do it last time? You want to get down there and go, well, let me just blow it all up and try something totally different and see where it takes me. Yeah. Rules and the regulations, just kind of, you know, creative spit and posh. Well, that's what I tried to do with the song, with the, with the Maidens, you know, because I, the last thing, I, I want to grow as a writer, I want to get better. And I thought the last thing that I should do is try and copy my first novel. It would have been easy just to do like a, a chamber piece again with six characters, but I thought I'd like to do something with a bigger canvas and a bigger story and a, you know, a deeper, darker story. Um, and I really tried to push myself as hard as I could. Um, I think it would have been a mistake to try and copy oneself. I think you should always try and grow, and expand and, you know. Well, you certainly did. And The Maidens, you know, is a totally different book from The Silent Patient. Um, and I was, in, I was intrigued, you know, quite frankly, with all of it. I learned a lot that I didn't know. Um, you and I talked about it before, um, the twists and turns. I'm usually, you know, pretty good at figuring things out. And this was, this was just terrific. 
Um, and I think people are going to love uh, the story in the novel and will wait anxiously for your next one. Um, so let me ask you this. What do you, what's the thing you love most about writing and what's the thing that you love least about it? Hmm. Um, what do I, what I, I hate the solitude, I think, is probably the hardest bit. My favorite bit of writing The Maidens was when I gave it to um, my fantastic editor in at Celadon, um, Ryan Doherty and um, Imad Akhtar in London. And uh, the three of us worked on Zoom, I don't know, twice a week, but it was like, but then we did, I go away and write and then we get back together for another writing session. And it was like, it went on for quite a while, this process. And they're both so brilliant. And so that's one thing that's amazing because they made the book so much better and they made, they challenged me and made me better as a writer, which was incredible. But more than that, it was, I've never had a kind of, you know, common goal with people that you really respect, who you're intimate with, who are funny and smart and friendly. And so suddenly you go from this process of spending, I spoke two and a half years to write that book on my own, on my own, on my own. And then suddenly you're with these two amazing guys and you're having a laugh about it. And they're, they're telling you, giving you ideas about your characters that are truer and better than the stuff that you've been coming up with. And so it's a quite, I feel quite emotional about it because suddenly it's like having a family and a little child that you're kind of raising together. Um, and so that's the hardest bit I think about writing is, is being alone, um, but it's the most necessary bit as well, you know? Yes, I mean, I think human beings are social creatures and even if you weren't after the pandemic, hopefully you would be because who wants to get <laughs> Like, you know, I, I look forward to it. I've had the same editor. Um, he's now an agent uh, with my, my agent's agency, but because uh, I didn't want to change editors at this stage of my career, the publisher actually still retains him to edit my books. We've done like 25 books together. Um, and when I, when I send the book up to him, I sort of wait anxiously about what I'm going to learn about, you know, when, once he reads the pages, because it's a totally different perspective. And I always find things that, you know, he thinks about and talks about and asks questions about that I didn't necessarily focus on. I thought that that was vital, is vital, it's important. Uh, but at the end of the day, our goals are completely aligned perfectly. We just want to make the story as good as it possible to be. And that's, you know, and that's a good edit, editor writer relationship. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we, we should probably start taking some questions. I think we've got a, a, lunch, a bunch of them queued up. So if we want to do that, let's go. Sure. We have a bunch of questions and it was a lot of fun to hear you two talk shop. This first question is from Nancy. Hi, Alex, Nancy from Inez. Um, we both know it's the journey and not the destination that's important in life. How was the journey for the maidens different than the silent patient, particularly after your first big success? Hi, Nancy, how are you doing? Um, uh, I, I don't know, it, it was entirely different because it, previously I was really alone. Um, when I wrote The Silent Patient, and I had no um, anticipation that anybody would ever read it. Um, you know, my career was kind of really in a bad place, and I was even dropped by my last agent when I was writing it. Uh, before, you know, he was not even read it. Um, and so I, I didn't think anyone was ever going to see the novel. Um, and so it, it was a very private, intimate thing. Um, and then for, for The Maidens, it was kind of wonderful, because it, I, felt, I felt I'd proved something to myself, and I was able to receive kind of, you know, encouragement um, from all of these publishers around the world, particularly Celadon in, in New York. Um, and so it felt like I, my, my world had expanded a lot um, and I felt a lot happier. Um, it, so it was great. Um, yeah. Good to know. Um, let's see, we've got, mm, this is definitely leaning toward a spoiler. Sorry, Carrie. Uh, let's see. Hello, what do you do when you experience writer's block? Do you have any tips? Thank you. I've never had writer's block. Um, I don't know what David thinks about that. Maybe he can give an answer to that one. I've never, I've never had it. I feel, um, I, I've always felt more that I've got too, you know, too much to try and get out and I don't know how to kind of refine it or write the right thing or, um, so I've never really had that problem actually. Maybe I should. David, what, what, what do you, you don't get writer's block? Presumably having written so many novels, I don't believe that. This, you know, I, I don't like the term writer's block. Writer's block, it's just, that's just thinking of, things you need to think about in order to complete a novel and complete a scene. Um, so it's just all part of the process. What I do, you know, I'm like you, I'll go take a walk, I'll take the dogs for a walk, or I'll, I'll go take a shower. Uh, I've solved more sort of plot issues in the shower than I can, you know, <laughs> and, the, and the added attribute to that is I'm incredibly clean all the time. So that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> the shower, I agree with. I, I shower a lot and walk, you know, every, yeah, I suppose that's a good answer is, is walking. If I am, um, 
I get to the end of the day and I don't feel happy with what I've done, I'll go and walk for an hour in the park. And then the answer always comes to you um, and you, you something, you know, and then something arrives by the time you've got back to your house. So when I was working in the clinic, I, I always say this, but it was so true. Um, one of the things that the psychiatrists used to say to the teenagers was um, move a muscle to change a thought. And so if the kids were sitting there in a depressed, depressive state, they would just nudge them and say, move a muscle to change a thought. And they'd go, go for a walk or, or play a game or something. And so there's something about physical movement, either walking or having a shower or tidying. I do a lot of obsessive tidying when I'm stuck as well. That helps you distract yourself, I think. And then your subconscious mind can solve the problem. This one's for both of you. How closely does the finished book resemble your first draft? And can you describe your revision process? You talked about Zoom briefly, Alex, and working with your editor, David. I imagine you do something similar. Mm. Alex, you want to go first? Or? Um, we get, yeah, I mean, I, uh, the, what, what's, what's really frightening about it, and I think this is again about fear and control, is that I will, I, 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 in both, both of these novels, I had a first draft that I then spent months revising and rewriting and doing draft after draft. And then I compared that draft with the first draft, and they were identical. So that was a bit frightening. Um, and then, so I think that this time I've told Ryan this, that I'm gonna be brave enough to give him the drafts sooner. I think it's important to, to, you know, to let it go sometimes and sort of, it's something about trying to control every aspect and moving words around and everything obsessively isn't, isn't really helpful. I think you need to um, get people on board sooner, I think. Um, I don't know, what, what do you think, David? Uh, there's, a, there's a library in Maryland that has a collection of first drafts of famous novels and then obviously the final novel itself they have. The Great Gatsby, your first draft, Fitzgerald did, and then the finished product. I always thought that the, a lot of work obviously goes into the first draft. Uh, it should be similar to the finished draft as far as the framework, the core structure of the story, and the characters. If it's if it's dramatically different, then you know you didn't build the foundation of the house right. You just sort of knocked it down halfway through and had to rebuild it somewhere along the line. But I've always thought that the first draft is just this purge of all the stuff that's in your head, trying to put the story together. You throw a lot of elements out there. It's a little bit wobbly. It's got a little bit of fat all over the place. Some things don't tie up uh, nicely and neatly, but it's all critical to actually getting you to the final draft as well. All that stuff has to be there. I've always, I've always thought that, you know, the first draft is typed and then the, in the, in the final draft is where the novel comes from, changes from just being a story to being a novel that people can actually read and enjoy. Um, and it's a refining process. Um, yeah. I've always found that when you, you know, when I start out, the, the, the work is, tends to be a little bit bloated. Um, and if I can say in 10 words what I said in 100 words in the first draft, all the better. You know, Abraham Lincoln, one of, the, one of the greatest presidents we've ever had, he probably gave the greatest political speech in American history, the Gettysburg Address. It was only 365 words long. It only mm -hmm. took him four and a half minutes to say it. The guy who spoke before him spoke for two and a half hours. Nobody remembers that guy or what he said at all. Um, and Lincoln used to have this, you know, this, this practice. He would write a condolence letter to every mother who lost a son in the Civil War, to the extent he could. He couldn't write to all of them or too many, unfortunately. His most famous letter was to a woman who lost all five of her sons in the war. And he started off the letter saying, I apologize for the, for the long length of this letter. If I'd had more time to write it, it would have been far shorter, far shorter and far more powerful. Wow. So for me, the editorial process of taking this blob of clay and turning it into something that actually looks like something. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good advice. What I what I tend to do um, is I, I print it out um, because it has a different uh, quality texture when you actually are holding something in your hand. Um, and then I sit with a pencil and I and I kind of ed read it and edit, and then I type up the changes and then I print it out again and then I do that same process. And I, for the silent patient, I probably did that a hundred times over about a year. And what was really terrifying was that the, the corrections weren't getting fewer, they were just getting different each time. And I thought this, and this is never gonna stop. But then eventually after about a year, they did get less and less and less until one day it was finished and I read it through and I had no corrections to make. And then I, then I tried to get an agent after that, but it took that long. And I, you know, my biggest advice to writers, um, to, to kind of, you know, budding writers or, or whatever, or unpublished writers is, is don't think it's ready at the first draft because it isn't. Um, and, and people think just because they've written one draft that it's ready and it'll be published and they can send it out and then they're hurt and angry when it gets rejected. And it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's in your mind's eye still at that, at that point in the, in the first draft. You need someone else maybe to help you see it objectively or put it away for six weeks 
is Stephen King recommends that, and I've always done that. I always put the first draft away for at least a month to get some distance from it and then come back to it. Um, and you need to revise it, you know, so keep rewriting. I, um, the editorial process that I go through, you know, on my own, certainly a lot of revisions, and then it goes to the publisher, the editor, and then it goes to the publisher. So I have, you know, now we do a lot of electronic editing, which all just on there. And so I'll do two drafts of that back and forth with um, the publisher copy editing and all that. And then I do two drafts from them um, in the page groups where it's, it's printed out. Um, and I pick up my red and my blue pens. And I just bloody the pages. I, I think better in cursor. You know? There's this buffer between when I'm typing and it's going on the screen. I'm a pretty good typist, but I hate that buffer between clicking. I hate it too. Oh my gosh, so, I so so agree. It's driving me mad because I think about this a lot and I try and I get so frustrated because when I have ideas and I try to put them on my phone, my clumsy fingers, you end up mistyping things and then you lose your thread. And even when you're typing a, a, a manuscript, I, I, I can't, it, it slows me down this process of typing. So then a couple of days ago, I made a note to myself, you know, explore dictaphones because I thought maybe that might be a way forward, but I don't know about that. I, I, you know, this, for me, this is where the novel comes together. When I write in the margins and I scratch stuff out, it's the old fashioned way. I love looking at other writers from the past, their marginalia and their edits on the page. You know, they had just had this big Hemingway documentary in PBS. And they had a lot of those pages where he showed that. I, I could look at those pages for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm so excited about that. It's coming to the UK. They're showing it soon, the six part one. I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm obsessed with, with him particularly, but also with his, his writing, the way he, the, everything he wrote about writing is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, I wonder if I could challenge something that you said, David, uh, about structure and foundation. <clears throat> and I wonder if either one of you ever wandered up, wandered into a completely different place than you started, i.e. just through the process. I'm doing it now, actually. Um, it's, it's funny you say that. So as an experiment, um, after finishing uh, The Maidens, I am now attempting to write something with very little planning. Um, and it, it really sounds crazy, but it's almost, it's almost kind of rediscovering my love for writing because I've never written something before with a smile on my face since I was a teenager, probably. But every day I'm being a little surprised about where the story's going. And the fact that it's an experiment um, means that I'm free to do it because if it fails, it doesn't matter if it fails. But if I were to think this is my next book, I would be way too scared to wing it like that. I don't, I don't know what David thinks. Well, I, um, we were down in Florida over the winter and again, all my travel was canceled. So I was, um, I'd finished the third uh, Archer novel that'll come out um, next year. And I was gonna be writing the next Amos Decker, which would be Amos Decker number seven. Um, and in April, I had an idea you know, sometimes you tend to write about people your own age. When I was in my 30s, you know, most of my characters in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and, you know, you keep going. Um, but I had an idea for younger characters in their 20s and 30s in a place that I'd never really written about, but I had traveled a lot to and knew pretty well. Um, I was riding my bike and this idea popped into my head. It was something I was interested in and maybe I'd been thinking about for a while. Nobody knows I'm writing it. I haven't told anybody about it. And, um, but I was so immersed in there. I didn't outline any of it. So I sat down and, you know, started on April 20th and I just finished it yesterday. Wow. And I don't know, you know, I'm sure I'll send it up and, and, no, and after all the books I've written, my, I'm sure my publisher will be like, this is great. You know, I think we'll publish it. Don't worry. Um, but it's totally, it's different. I mean, it's a thriller, but it's, it's a different structure and it's a different sort of hero that I've never really put together before. Um, sometimes it's just, it's an, it's an impulse, you know, I remember clearly you're riding my bike down the street and just thinking this character and what he might be able to do. And I went back and not knowing, you know, this is going to be a 10 page short story, a hundred page novel or an actual novel. Um, but isn't it amazing? Cause it, it makes more sense for me that I would do that as a, after my, after I've written two books, but it's amazing to me that you're doing that. Having written so many books, you're still being that creative about it, which is incredible. I, you know, I, I'm sort of like you, I spent, I spent 15 years of my life writing short stories. Um, I was in high school. I was trying to get published in Playboy magazine because back then they published everybody. Terrific, Joyce Carol Oates and, and, um, and um, lots of writers that I really uh, admired greatly in Story Magazine and Atlantic Monthly. Um, and then I started writing teleplays, then novellas, then screenplays. I was interested in the story. That's what really drove me. And I didn't have any success for any of those years. I didn't really sell anything during that time, but I learned a lot about myself 
about things that interested me and about you know what my process might be as far as writing. But I think at the end of the day, if you want to have a really long career, every time you have to challenge yourself with something new, it, it is just so easy to fall into a rut in this process. And it's very easy. And I know lots of writers across all types of genres. Um, it's just very easy to fall into the, how did I do it last time kind of thing. And I don't say that as a cliche or tongue in cheek. I, I say that forcefully. And, and that is how a lot of people sort of approach it. It's a job. It's a paycheck. Uh, this is how I make my living. However, I can get the product out as quickly as I can, as effortlessly as I can, uh, I will do it. And for me, that's sort of not how I want to live my life as a writer. So for me to, even at this you know, advanced stage of my career, uh, to scare the crap out of myself and try something new that may or may not work, it's the best thing I can do for myself. That's great. Well, following on the last question, um, and I think you may have answered, both of you may have answered it a bit, do you know who is going to be the villain of your stories from the start of writing, or do you discover who will be the villain as you get closer to the end? Well, I think with the kind of novels that you know I write, which I think of as you know psychological detective stories, it's very much about the architecture of it. And so I need to know where I'm going. I need to know you know who the killer is. I need to know what the twist is. Um, how you get there is a whole different question. And I. Um, I really struggled with that, with, with The Maiden. So there is a little story about that, which is, I think, helpful for, for writers. Um, I, uh, I, I, I didn't, I know what I, I knew what I wanted the end to be. Um, I knew what I wanted the twist to be, but I didn't know how to make it work. And I wrestled with it and struggled with it and then decided to abandon it. Um, and I decided to write a very simple version of the story that I was working on instead. Um, and then coincidentally, uh, a friend of uh, mine introduced me to the British crime writer, Sophie Hanna. Um, and she and I ended up being left alone together and having coffee. And she's an incredible person, a very forceful personality. And she just said to me, tell me the story of your next novel. I'm very excited because I love this aunt patient. And I, um, and just because she, she put it like that, I was just taken aback. And I told no one about this at all. And so, but I told her about the simplified version that I was writing and she kind of, her face kind of fell. And she went, oh, after the silent patient, I was expecting a little bit more. And I kind of, you know, died inside. Um, and then she said, why do you tell me about the idea that you abandoned instead? And I told her about this idea and she said, that's a great story and that's the one that you should write. And I said, I don't know how to make it work. I don't know how to make the ending work. And she said, if God came down right now and he said to you, Alex, you have to make that ending work, how would you do it? And the crazy thing is, by the time I left Cambridge, got on the train, went back to London, the answer had come to me. And I think that's a really great example of how creativity works, that on some level, she gave permission to my subconscious to fix it um, in a way that I wasn't able to before, because I think I was coming at it from a negative space and she's the most positive human being I've ever met. Um, but that, you know, that's a great example, I think, of, um, of not knowing how to get somewhere. Um, yeah, so I owe her a lot, I think. Uh, it's absolutely great advice. You guys should write a book together in the future, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, she's, you know, she's doing the Agatha Christie's right now. So I'm kind of jealous of that gig. I said to her, can I have it when you're done with it, please? <laughs> yeah, Christie is big enough to spread the wealth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> she said to me, she said to me, you can have Miss Marple. And I said, I don't want Miss Marple. <laughs> well, see, we've got, we've got more questions than we have time for. So I'm going to skate through some of these um, and do them in pricey form. Uh, Pure Foy and um, picking up your novel and then asking about um, what drew the, the upshot here is, Alex, what drew you to the, use Greek mythology in the story uh, and especially the Persephone story? Oh, it's, it's easy that you, because I'm, I'm Greek, you see, and so um, I don't mean that in a facetious way. I mean that the story for me is about Mariana. It's about my heroine who is, is haunted. Um, the very first image that came to me in about the novel was kind of dreamlike and it was a woman alone in a house going through her her dead husband's possessions and she couldn't throw anything away and then that ended up becoming the first chapter of the novel and so I um when you're writing the story about grief and your Greek your first thoughts go to uh, Persephone the story of Persephone you know who was um abducted by Hades and taken to the underworld and her mother Demeter's grief was so immense where she just sat down and wouldn't be moved and wept and winter, day, some, day turned to night and summer turned to winter. And, and it's, it's such a, you know, I grew up with that story in my head as, as an example of, of overwhelming, passionate grief. Um, and so it kind of, I went from that to Persephone and then I kind of worked it back into the novel. And so 
it's very much like a kind of um, a backwards and forwards motion. I think, you know, theme leads to plot and then that inspires more theme, which inspires more plot and it just gets richer and deeper. This one is from Siddhartha. This is a great, there is a great deal of suffering and violence in the world now. How do you deal with this and keep it from affecting your creative life? Maybe you can both tee off on that one. David, what do you think about that? Hmm. A great deal of violence and grief in the world and how does that affect my work? Well, how do you, how do you deal with it and keep it from affecting your creative life or let it in and let it and use it? I think I think current events in the world. I'm you know I'm a very political person, and um, I participate a lot in this country uh, in that process. And I read about it all the time, and I talk to people in the field because it's very important. It impacts everybody's life. I love writing about Washington D.C. because it's the only city on in the United States that can raise your federal income tax and declare war. Those two things alone justify its you know elevated status in our lives. Um, I use it as I use it as uh, fuel for a lot of stories. Um, early on in my career, I would get on my soapbox probably too much in my stories and would sort of channel my opinions and philosophies through some of my characters. I'm a little more judicious about it now, but it still permeates my stories um, because I, I, my stories deal with a lot of the things that, you know, life throws at you and, we're, and I'm dealing with personally. Um, I wouldn't write about the pandemic in any of my novels because everybody's sick of it. I don't want to be reminded of it. Nobody wants to be reminded of it. Uh, but at the same time, when you're talking about Social injustice, poverty, you know, capitalism versus you know a more fair, equitable system. All of that stuff can be told in a thriller. It can be told in a mystery through the characters and the framework of the story you put together. So I don't want to ignore it. I use it as fuel for my stories. Right, that's really helpful. I'm more along the lines of the pandemic thinking myself because I'm such an escapist and a fantasist, and so. They think of the books that I write as, as an escape from the real world. They're set in a slightly heightened world, um, like the, the, you know, the old thrillers that I love to read. And so when I turn to that kind of book, it's definitely as a kind of source of solace and escape, as opposed to kind of bringing the horrors of the world into it. Um, yeah. Here are a couple of questions to go out on. Um, Alex, somebody asks, I'm curious, do you have a favorite Greek myth or character? And in addition to that, Favorite Agatha Christie novel? Um, I do have a favorite character and I'm thinking a lot about her right now from Greek mythology because I grew up in Cyprus and Cyprus was Aphrodite's island. And I've been researching a lot about her um, recently and I didn't realize that she was the oldest of all the gods. Um, and she, she was born just off the coast of Cyprus and she swam there and she claimed the island as her own. And there are relics and ruins and temples of her all over Cyprus. And so I'm thinking, oh, I'd like to write about Aphrodite and Cyprus at some point because it feels very integral to who I am. And what was the second part about Christie? What was it? Favorite Agatha Christie novel. Um, five Little Pigs, because it's perfect, because it's only like five or six characters um, and you'll never guess who did it. And the answer is right there in front of you. And she makes you look at the wrong way, at the wrong, everything the wrong way around, right from the first page. It's, uh, so I recommend everybody reads that. It's really good. Terrific. Gentlemen, this has been a wonderful discussion. For those attendees at home, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you didn't get a copy of the book, if you just click on the chat, you'll see that there's a link there that you can use to the Joseph Fox Bookshop where you can actually get signed copies of The Maidens. David, Alex, what a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Great talking to you, Alex. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank David, it was an honor. Thank you so much. All right, we'll see, we'll see you in Philadelphia next year or the year after. Yeah, I hope so. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.